have the mind of God. Thank you. Thank God for our brother. Amen. That's practical wisdom right there. Amen. Mark chapter 10 in God's word. I'm going to read verses 5 to 9. And uh, I'll be honest, you probably never thought of this verse in this manner, in this fashion. Um, in God's word as we, we dive in. Say amen if you're there. Two people, three You there yet? Are we there yet? I sound like the Ice Cube movie. Are we there yet? So we, before we get into this, I just want to say, you know, I'm a person that my highs tend to last long. What I mean by that is when I, um, I'm not talking about drug highs, guys. I'm talking about, come on, guys, stay with me. I'm talking about when, when I go through something. I remember, I, remember I've, I, I've had, I have so much fun at concerts, especially when souls get saved. I could be off a concert high till Tuesday from a Saturday concert. And I, I, I got to make a confession. I'm still high from Andrew and Letitia's wedding. <laughs> I am. I, just a personal confession. I still am. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad they got married, you know, just before this series, All Things Relationships. Um, it's really, uh, they're just they're the vows and, and just really meditating on a lot of med- marriage-related verses have really got my mind engaged in this subject, in this topic. And I really want to help you in uh, a message that's going to help you for those of you who are not married. So, Andrew Letitia, you can lay back and just, you know, Charity, you can lay back and just chill. Uh, but if you're not married, amen, this message is more here for you. Amen. And even if you are married, there's still certain things, amen, that I'm, I might say or touch on that you can apply in your life, amen. But this series, amen, this, this series has an intention to help us restore the integrity, the sexual integrity of the local church. And so in order for us to do that, as I stated last week, we have to not just judge and uh, rebuke sin, but we have to teach people. And, and how to apply knowledge, right? That, that wisdom is knowledge uh, uh, effectively applied. We know that. But we, we have to train people, and people need to know how to make better decisions regarding relationships. And so we got to teach on these things. And, I, you know, I've been stirred. You know, I, I wanted to preach. Uh, I've decided to ruin my life, but I've been really seeking God this week uh, for just something fresh, and I, and I, I wanted to just preach embracing uh, 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 singleness, which uh, half of you have probably heard. But I, I, I've been sharing with some of you. I've been seeking God, really. Just I need something fresh. And here we go. I have something fresh for you tonight. You know, one of the strategies of, of, of evil that's blatant in our d- generation, our day and age, is definitions, how things are defined. And there's an attack on the definition of gender. Can you say Amen. There's an attack on the definition of marriage. There's an attack on the definition on church and what church is. But the good news tonight is that we have the word of God. That we, we don't have to worry about what the world is doing. We know we have the word of God. And so I want to bring to you a verse tonight. And you've probably never. Some of you are going to come to me and you say, Pastor, I don't know what Bible you're reading. But I, I've never looked at this verse in this way. And so I want to look, let's look tonight at this scripture that's really profound. I believe God really spoke to me in viewing this in this fashion. Mark 10, verse 5 to 9. The Bible says, Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote to you this precept. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So then there are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. I want to help you, amen, and talk to you about preparing yourself for marriage tonight. Uh, in a sermon I've entitled, uh, All Things Relationships, Part 2, Become One to Be One. In our scripture tonight, Jesus is speaking, 
I'm going to just challenge some of the men to say amen tonight. Amen. Uh, just give, give me some help. Amen. Tonight. I just Instead of just being precious and Lorenda all the time, maybe get some of the guys to say amen. That would be good for a chance. Thank you, Lorraine. Amen. Not obnoxiously. Amen. We're really going to take care of you after the service. Amen. Uh, but try to help me out tonight. Our scripture, Jesus is speaking to the religious people of his day and age. He's answering a question. I want you to follow me before I get to this point. He's answering a question regarding divorce, and he makes reference to how Moses dealt with the people of his day and age. But I want to draw your attention. Here it is, friends. I want to draw your attention to verse 8, where he says something profound that usually skips right over our head. Verse 8 says, and the two shall become one flesh and then they were no longer two but they are one now when we read this verse what are we thinking about we're thinking about this verse in a numerical sense that there is one wife marrying one husband can you say amen this is how we view and how we look at this verse. And this is clearly what it's implying. But I believe tonight that it goes beyond that. I believe tonight that when God envisions people getting married, that he's not envisioning a broken person marrying a broken person, but rather that he is envisioning a whole person marrying a whole person. Leave that verse up there tonight, and I want you to think about the number one. In scripture, the number one always signifies unity and completion. The Bible is saying that from the very beginning, God is establishing marriage, and he's saying that marriage has to be between two people who are whole. That this, beloved, goes beyond a numerical sense. Uh, this goes beyond just Jelson being one person and Charity being one person. It goes beyond Andrew being one uh, and Letitia being one. Uh, but this is speaking of tonight uh, wholeness. That you are, not, you are not ready for marriage until you are one. That you are not ready for marriage. You're not going to, com to make a complete unit uh, if you are broken. I don't believe two broken pieces uh, can make a whole. I don't believe two, more, two broken pieces uh, are the will of God. Uh, and this is not what the scripture is teaching us. Uh, and this really dismantles a lot of people's ideas uh, in terms of marriage preparation. Because here's what we think. Are they old enough? Isn't that, isn't that what we think? Age. And then there's other, you know, you know we have the, the woke movement. Well, age is nothing but a number, right? Right? So, that, so there's age, and we think finances, right? How much money's in his pocket? Is he an engineer or not? Come on, somebody, talk to me. Ladies, you want money? Hey, I, I have, Sheridan and I have a lady friend, and, uh, and she says, hey, listen, I was born. I was born to stay home. I was born for this. Uh, she plans. She says, listen, man, I'm going <laughs> to, it's just clapping. <laughs> Hey, it's coming out. Come on, let it out, guys. Let it out. Right? Money. Does he have money? How much money is he going to make? Is he a hard worker? Come on, somebody. And this, these are the things that people, and listen, these things are fine and dandy, yo, but these are the things that people think about. Uh, they think age. They think character. They think finances. Uh, but the Bible is telling us that God is envisioning marriage, uh, and he's envisioning a whole marrying a whole. He's envisioning two complete people uh, being together. Right? The two broken pieces uh, do not make a whole. God wants us to be one. I want to just make a statement here. Uh, I'm going to dive in and shift my gear here a little bit. Uh, courtship is not the time to learn how to read your Bible. Listen, I'm preaching this evening uh, that, listen, we're not to be learning and establishing spiritual discipline and spiritual habits uh, when we're courting and when we're looking for a partner. Talk to me, somebody. Listen, when we're here at a state where we think we're ready for marriage, this is not the state where we're saying, oh, I need to, I need to really uh, master going to church every service. You're not whole. You're not complete. You're not one. You're half. You're, there's something about you. There isn't the faithfulness, the commitment that you need to enter into a relationship you have. 
And the Bible says that one, the two of them shall be one flesh. And so courtship, friends, uh, I'll say this again. Uh, you don't enter into a courtship and say, hey, let's read and pray together. I, I really need help with that. That's not the time. No, I'm being serious tonight, friends. You're laughing, but I'm being serious. It's not the time. Listen, I'm going to tell you what courtship is. It's not the time to learn how to maintain and build relationships. Courtship, and you're going to laugh, but courtship is the time to answer the question, am I crazy enough to spend the rest of my life with this lunatic? That's courtship. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching tonight. That's courtship. Am I crazy enough? Some of you will translate it. Do I love her enough? Do I love him enough to spend the rest of my life with this crazy person? Listen, my wife didn't have much time to answer that question. We got saved in September, and she had from September to November to say, am I crazy enough to spend the rest of my life with this lunatic? That's what courtship is, friends. It's getting to know this person. It's answering the question, uh, will I be committed? Uh, am I okay to spend the rest of my life with you? Well, courtship uh, is not the time uh, to learn uh, how to witness. If you don't know how to witness, don't get married. If you don't know how to study the word of God, uh, don't look at her. Don't look at him. Keep your eyes on Jesus. What are you going to do when you begin courting? And the person asks, have you read the Bible from cover to cover? And you've been in church three years. What are you going to do? And your answer is no. What are you going to say? Just, 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 just think about that. If, 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 I, if that was me, and you've been in church for two years, I am not, I'm just deleting your number. Because I know if God's word, if you don't love God's word, you're going to struggle loving me. I'm preaching tonight, friends. If you don't love God's word, you, there's no way you're going to love me. Courting, courting, listen to me tonight. Courting is not the time to learn how to pray. It's not the time to learn, how to, uh, to, to learn these things. Oh, come, let's, let's, let's buy candy and skip rope together. <laughs> And just pray. Okay, I can pray for five minutes. What about you? Oh, my gosh. Let's pray together. Oh, my gosh. That's not a courtship. You're wasting your life. Courtship, friends, is a time of holiness. It is a time where you suppress your feelings and your temptations and you exercise self-control. The same self-control that's been flowing through you through the whole, your relationship with the Holy Spirit. That is what courtship is. It is a time where, yes, you're in a relationship, but you're not going to be kissing. Can you say amen? You're not going to be touching. Can you say amen? It is a time where you're going to be setting boundaries. Why are you able to do this? Because your whole life prior to that, you've been setting boundaries. And so you're only able to do these things because you're whole. It is a time where you protect one another's purity. The man has to have the mindset, I need to show integrity to this woman of God this daughter of God the woman needs to have the mindset I need to protect my brother who's going to leave me who's going to be my husband now, I'm sorry for how that sounds but that's the reality amen now, and then that needs to be the mindset protection uh, of purity the question is how can we expect that for someone to have self-control when they're courting when they don't have it without courtship listen if you don't have these basic things before, don't look at someone. Do not look. Do not look at the opposite sex. You're not, marriage is for two whole people. Come on, somebody. It's not for two broken people. This is why people enter into courtship and they keep falling and falling and falling and falling. And you notice there's no power. You're not ready. Marriage is not going to fix your lust problem. It's not going to fix your lack of self-control issues. There's a pattern. You notice there's a pattern, self, lack of self-control. It, it takes two whole people to make this marriage that God wants, something that is God-fearing. You might be wondering what happened to Charity and I. What happened to Charity and I was an absolute miracle. 
and I shared this last week, Wednesday, that this is an anomaly, that it takes a strong man of God to lead a woman of God to love Jesus Christ. To be an example, amen. And none of this is alluded to my own strength, but it was definitely the spirit of God, the, the grace of God that was working in my life that led her to be the woman of God that she is today. And I thank God that I had desires, that I wanted to be like my pastor. I had a spiritual goal. Uh, there is a, for spiritual maturity. This is what I aimed for. Uh, I had someone that I was following, and my wife was able to look at my life and see that I wasn't walking around aimlessly, but that I had purpose. And that is what happened with Jelson and Charity. That is the anomaly. Because it's not often, friends, that, God, that, that, that people can come in at two broken people. Because what I've just described was me and Charity. Two broken people at an altar saying, yes, I do. But yes, God can work miracles and God can do things. But friends, uh, most of you have a chance. Uh, you have a chance to avoid that and become whole before you say, I do. Let's talk about being broken and how to be whole. The first step tonight of being whole is salvation. Say amen. amen. Every single one of us is broken. Listen, I don't care. I don't care if you, your, your sinful life is described to, I was just reading books at home. You're a sinner and you're broken. It, it, listen, it doesn't matter. Your, come on, say amen, somebody. Amen. Sister Evan likes that because she knows it's true. I don't care if, you're, if you're, your sinful life is like Lorenda's past uh, and all she did was read, read books in her room. Uh, listen, sinner and broken. Because the Bible says all of us have sinned. And sin breaks us. That is the nature of sin, friends. Um, and this is what the Bible teaches. And so uh, our healing begins uh, at salvation, friends. Our healing begins at the cross. But we see something that it continues, that our healing continues, that although we get saved, we make a decision, we turn from our sins, Jesus saves us, gives us a new heart. All these things are at work. Although these things happen, we look at a man in scriptures named Lazarus. Here he is. Jesus says, Lazarus, comes out, come out. But he comes out wrapped in grave clothes. In other words, he comes out bound. And so we can be saved and still broken. We can be saved and still bound them john eleven forty four. 44 the man came out and his feet and his uh, his hands and his feet was bound in grave clothes his face was wrapped in head cloth jesus told them uh, unwrap him and let him go think about this who did jesus tell to unwrap him them this man's wholeness was a work of god through the hands of people leave that verse up there Jesus calls a dead man out of his grave. He's alive. How many know in sin we're dead? Did he not call you? Did you not respond? You're alive. But you can still be bound. You can still have grave clothes. And so Jesus says the way we become free is a work from above through people's hands. And so this is why it's so important that we need people in our lives. When people live in isolation, it's a masquerade of brokenness. You know, if, if Lazarus would have came out the grave and seen Jesus, I'm alive. Oh, gee, that guy called me. And then Jesus says, tells people to go free him. And he would have ran. I ain't coming to church. He would have remained like that. And that's how some people are here tonight. When people don't have relationships with people in the church, it's a masquerade that they're broken. They don't want accountability. They don't want to be transparent. Come on, man. I want to get some of the men to say amen tonight. They don't want, they don't want spiritual growth. They don't want relationships in the church because they don't want to be whole. And so, it's so they're, they're, people can spend months and weeks in church running away from the same people God wants to use to make them whole. And that happens. This is the reality of life. If you want to get married tonight, become whole. If you want to get married, if you want to entertain a relationship in future years, yeah, most of you are students. You want to get your money up. You want to get your money right. Up. But listen, you need to really take this seriously and say, I'm going to become whole. Embrace relationships. 
Embrace accountability. Embrace friends, meaningful relationships in church. Because until that, uh, the work of God that God wants to do in your life and freeing you from your bondage um, and all these things uh, will not come to pass. If you want to get married, you have to become whole. I think of my own life, something I wrestled with. Spirit of rejection. And I believe, and I've shared this with you guys countless times, I believe looking back now with the knowledge that I have, this was, this was an effect of the result of my father leaving the home. But what's interesting is when my dad left when I was 16, at that moment, I wasn't able to process the effects of it in my life internally. And so for me, it was like freedom, right? He's gone. I come home late. I can do whatever. I can disrespect my mom. I can do whatever, right? And so my life just began to feel free when internally I was being bound. So think with me, think with me that there are things that we experience in the world. There are things that we experience that were fun in the moment, but later on in life bound us. Even after conversion, come on church, talk to me. Even after salvation, we can be saved but bound. And so here I am, a young man. I got saved. I'm on fire for Jesus. I love Jesus. I'm at every outreach, every prayer meeting. Huh? But there are times when I'm haunted with this stronghold in my mind. I'm around people and I feel unwanted. I feel rejected. Huh? And I, begin, I had to go through a season where I begin to wrestle with God. Huh? And I begin to fast and pray because this truly tormented me and I remember a season as I said fasting praying weeping seeking God for deliverance from the stronghold until I remember the week I remember the time in my life when I was totally delivered um, and I can I can testify um, from my own experience um, and other people that I've heard that deliverance is for the desperate that you are not going to be, listen to me this evening, ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to be delivered until you become desperate. That, that listen, that God has power from heaven to rescue, to, to deliver you, to set you free from every stronghold, every faulty mindset. Uh, but it isn't until you are desperate enough to tap into that power that you'll receive that power, friends. I think, think with me uh, about the woman with the issue of blood. Here she is. She tries doctors. She wastes all her money. Uh, but it's, it wasn't in that moment of desperation, till that moment of desperation when she sees Jesus uh, and she was so desperate she her mindset was by any means necessary she says listen even though he's around the crowd i just gotta sneak around some people and i just gotta touch the hem of his garment if i just get a little bit of power from jesus i can be delivered and the bible says her bleeding stopped because being desperate is how you find, how you become. Listen, there are people here. You, you can work. Your age to get married can come. You can work and make enough money to get married, but you're still broken. You're not one. You got to get desperate. The Bible talks to us about a, a man named Jacob who wrestled with God, Genesis 32, 26 to 32. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. This is the mindset we need to have tonight. He said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with man and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name. And I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him from there. Oh, thank God how God can bless us when we wrestle, when we wrestle with him. Verse 30, so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God's face, to, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle of the strength, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the muscle that shrank. Jacob is a representation of you and I here tonight. That he came to a point in his life. Here he is uh, running from Laban. Here, here he is. Uh, he's running. Uh, and here he is in this situation where he comes across his brother Esau. Uh, and he's threatened uh, for his life. He's afraid for his life. Uh, and here he is in the midst. Uh, he comes uh, to the point. Like 
all this brokenness, he comes to a point in his life where he begins to acknowledge his sin. He begins to acknowledge his character flaws. He begins to acknowledge that just like his father, he's a deceiver. And he begins to acknowledge what, what is defining him in his life. And he comes to a point where he says, enough is enough. I'm done with running. I'm going to wrestle with God. And the Bible gives us hope. That when you wrestle with God, he can change you. Can you say amen tonight? Here's a man who had promise from God. All of us here tonight have promise from God. But yet was a deceiver because of his past that is how the bible described him but he wrestled with god and his name became israel listen to me tonight your name can be murderer there are women in almost every church that, like, that come in and have a past of being promiscuous. And at, at a time in their past, they've made a mistake and they went to an abortion clinic and, and they talked to their friends and family members and everyone allowed this. But there's a God in heaven who's looking at this as murder. And that could be your past, but God can change your name. And that is the reality. That abortion is murder, and that could be your name. But God can change your name. Your, your name could be rejected like mine, but God can change your name to accept it. Can you say amen? God can change your name. Your name can be promiscuous. You're, maybe you were a thief. Your name can be robber or thief, but God can change your name. Uh, listen, no matter what you wrestle with, no matter what you're broken with, uh, you can be prepared for marriage. You can be prepared to be one. You don't have to be broken your whole life. You don't have to be broken your whole Christianity. You don't have to be broken. And I'm not saying any of this happens instantly, friends. You're going to have to wrestle with God because he can change your name. You know, if you want to be whole, let me just say this in simple terms. You could. Yeah. If you want to be whole, you could. James 4, verse 8. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So here's what the Bible says, that the God in heaven, if you would take time to get close to him, he will take time to get close to you. Isn't that good news? Isn't that better than anything you heard all week? That he, he would get close to you. When it's all said and done, God will get close to you. So what does this look like? Being a woman and a man that's one. Being a woman and a man that is whole. What this looks like, when you're ready to, be, to, to, to embrace this big commitment called marriage, what this looks like is you're going to have a man of God and a woman of God. Right? That's what you're going to have. You're going to have a man of God and a woman of God binding themselves before God and witnesses and embracing a life of faithfulness to one another. That's what, that's what it's going to look like. When all of this happens, when we're, when we're no longer broken and the insecurities are gone and the rejections are gone and, and all these things that, things that have traumatized our minds are gone and we get before God at an altar uh, before witnesses um, and we get married, what that looks like is a man of God and a woman of God. So let's get deeper. What does that look like practically? Because some of you are like, okay, your pastor, you're saying man of God. I have no idea what that means. I have no idea what a woman of God means. Let's get deeper. Disciples are mature believers. They're people who can hold ministry positions. That's what that looks like. Come on, say amen. Right? They're, they're people you can count on. Say Amen. There are people who are reliable. That they, they, there are people who have a consistent love for God. That my love for God is not like behemoth. Come on, friends. Come on. You missed a good time to laugh right there. You ever, who ever, who ever been on behemoth here? Andrew. What's the other? She just got it. What's the other, what's the other one that came out the year before behemoth? That one's probably more popular. Let's really let's relive that moment. Your love for God is not like Leviathan. Come on, say amen. Your love for God shouldn't be a roller coaster. You should have a constant, a consistent love for Jesus and the things of God. 
This is what it means to be a man and a woman of God. That you don't have one foot in the world, one foot in the church. That all your friends are not worldly friends. In fact, you got rid of your worldly friends. Because they can't stand your love for Jesus. And if they can't stand your love for Jesus, and there isn't a love for Jesus. Because when there's darkness, and you turn on the light, what happens to the darkness? friends? Come on, somebody, talk to me tonight. They don't have worldly friends. They add to the local church. These are people that are now going to become power couples. These are people that are going to be blessed. They're going to be blessings unto people's lives. These are people that, listen, they experience a, a blessed, fruitful marriage. Because this is a man of God and a woman of God uh, getting married. When I say, if you do this, if you don't do this, if you don't do that, it's a recipe for disaster. I, I'm not just talking about divorce. This is the reality. Like, that you can be in a marriage and it's a total disaster and not get divorced. Why is it a disaster? Because it's unfruitful. Mark 11, 20 to 21. Listen to this. In the morning... Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you curse has withered away. So this is, this is Jesus. The, the, the night before, they went to a fig tree, and the fig tree had no fruit. So Jesus says, be cursed. They went away. The next morning, Peter sees that tree, and it's withered. And so what the Bible is saying, God is not into unfruitfulness. Now, listen, 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 friends. A marriage can be totally unfruitful. The only thing worse than one person doing nothing for God is two people doing nothing for God. Are you hearing me? I'm not just warning you. I'm not just here giving you red flags so that you don't end up in divorce. No, I'm teaching you how to have a successful marriage. That's going to make impact in the kingdom of God. The only thing worse than a person doing nothing for God is two people doing nothing for God. That that is a disaster, friends. And I've seen, listen, my wife and I, we've seen broken people get together. Uh, yeah, they're happy. Yeah, they get to have sex and they, get to, and they think it's healing them. Uh, but the reality is there's no impact. There's no fruitfulness. There's, no, there's nothing happening out of their marriage. You don't want that. You want your marriage to be fruitful. You want your marriage to glorify God. And, 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 and listen, that's not cliche. Everyone says that. But listen, let your marriage glorify God. And what I'm here to say to you tonight, friends, is a two broken people cannot glorify God until they become whole. I want to just close. This is my last time closing. I want to close and give some advice to our fellow sisters tonight. Amen. You know, we have men's discipleship classes. We help the men, right? We challenge them. Bro, start wearing deodorant, right? <laughs> we say, hey, bro, stop missing your deodorant days. You stink up the whole church. It's disgusting. Stop. Please stop coming here without showering. It's disgusting. So these are our men's discipleship classes, right, guys? And so, and so I want to have a woman's discipleship class, amen. I'm kidding. I, I want to just, I want to just, just one point. And ladies, I want you to hear me out. I, I really want you to hear me out tonight because this, this will make or break the impact your marriage has for the kingdom of God. And this is not a divorce issue or anything like that. But, what, but this is going to make or break. Will you, will you do anything for God with your husband? I want to help out the ladies for a bit here. If you're looking for a man to marry, here is a question. You like a guy in the church. Here's a question you need to ask. How is his relationship with his pastor? How is his relationship with headship? How, how, how does he do in that aspect 
in his life. You know, one, one of the worst mistakes you can make is to agree to submit to a man who isn't under submission himself. You're going to submit your whole life to a loose cannon. A man with no barriers. No one can speak into his life. No one can rebuke him and challenge him and speak to him. And you're going to go and say, I'm going to spend the rest of my life under this man. I'm going to submit to his authority when he's under no authority. How is his relationship with his pastor? Ladies, I'm, I'm telling you, as our church continues to grow, and men, you need to open your eyes. Just look, please help me out. Look beyond the six foot tallness. This is what helped my wife because there wasn't any. Just, ladies, help me out. Look beyond the dark skin. Look beyond all the, look beyond the possible abs. Look beyond all of that. And just look at his relationship. With, his, with headship. Who is he with head? You Listen, you don't want to go home with a man who has no reverence. With a man that, that, that just, 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 there's no reverence in his life. There's no man of God in his life. You don't want to do that. It is a recipe for disaster. Do not, do not entertain loose cannon. He's Mr. Self-Made Man. He's Mr. Self-Made Disciple. He, he doesn't live in accountability. Listen to me, lady. Listen to me. You're, it's not a joke. Listen to me. No one can rebuke him and speak into his life. No one can challenge him. And it's not just words and a head nod. I'm talking about a challenge he actually applies. No one can do that in his life. Pastor came here for uh, our grand opening. And this is just an example of something probably recent. And he's like, and he's looking and he says, tear down that wall. And some of you remember, we already had a wall up, right? Some of you remember, that was going to be our storage room. And, I'm, 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 and listen, it was a no-brainer because there's a pattern of my life that when the man of God that God's placed in my life says something, it's serious, it's not, just, oh, I, I, I've always wanted to go to Toronto. I'm going to go to Toronto. No, no, no. Pastor said, Oshawa. Pray about Oshawa. And look, look, God has brought us here, and you, you're saved. And ladies, ladies do, not, do not look, do not look at a rebel. They're men, they're rebels. They're, there's no reverence. As I said, there's, there's no men of God in their lives. No one they look up to and, and in fear, in a sense, so to speak. And I'm, I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying you're going to end up in divorce with this guy. I'm saying you'll never, never do anything for God. Never. Acts 16, verse 3. The Bible says this. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. So he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. Leave that verse up there for a moment. Let me tell you what this is saying. Paul takes his Timothy, his, his disciple Timothy, and circumcises him. That is personal. That is deep. That is an invasion of his personal life. He has embraced a man of God to remove areas in his life. And this symbolizes removal of the flesh, that a true disciple will have a pastor, that he is under the headship that can speak into their lives. And listen, it takes being a man of God to embrace that. It takes being, a, a man, it takes being whole to embrace that. I've been in areas, I, I, I've been in, in surroundings where you, you look around the, and here we are, we're, we're gathered around pastor, and, and, and the people that would fl reflect, or the people that wouldn't want that energy, there's an intimidation, or there's a pride. 
the removal of the flesh. Can, can the man you're looking at, the man you want to marry, is there a man above them that can speak into the, remove an area of their lives? Challenge them. Do they have that? Because if they don't, you're doomed. If you want to have a blessed, fruitful marriage, I want to say this. Listen to me carefully, ladies. Look for a man whose eyes are in a man of God. Every head bowed, every eye closed, and reverence to God tonight. Amen. Become one to be one. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're before God tonight. Amen. Amen. I want to give a call, amen, to anyone that's here tonight. You're not saved. You're not living for God. If you were to die today, you have no assurance that heaven will be your home. I want to tell you that Jesus loves you dearly. I want to tell you that he died for your sins. I want to tell you cares for you. I want to tell you he's calling you. And I'm, I'm not asking you tonight if you're born religious or if you believe in Jesus. I'm asking you, do you have assurance of your salvation? Do you know that you know that you know that if you were to die this moment, that heaven will be your home? If not, you can know. You can know tonight because Jesus says that if you trust in him, he will take you to heaven. He says if you put your faith and if you trust in him, he will ensure your salvation. And that can be you, friend. Your sin might lead you to hell, but Jesus came to wash away all your sin. If that's you tonight, you're saying, Pastor, I need prayer. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to surrender my all to him. I need prayer. I want you to pray for me. If that's you, I want you to lift your hands all over this place. Quickly. You're before God. Amen. Quickly, lift your hands. Pastor, pray for me. I need God in my heart. I need God in my life. I want you to lift your hands. If that's you, we're not going to hold this too long. God loves you. He's calling you. He cares about you. He knows your name. Thank God. Amen. I want to change the call. Maybe you were once living for Jesus, but you backslid. You want to rededicate your life to God. Will you lift your hands all over this place? You want to come back home. Amen. Thank God. Amen. Listen, I didn't spend too much time going over areas of brokenness. I spoke about my own trials, trials and, and dealing with rejection. But everyone has different traumas in their past. You need to let go of these. If you're dealing with bitterness, if you, if, you, if you struggle with building relationships, these are all symptoms of something from your past. And you need to come to a place like Jacob did where you're willing to wrestle with God. And I want to encourage you, let that place be at these altars tonight. Listen, don't listen. There, there are people that come to church and they're afraid of other people seeing them at the altar. They fear. They're like, oh man, that sermon was for me. Everybody knows that sermon has my name on it. Everybody's thinking of me. That's stronghold. That's bondage. If you think like that, that's stronghold. You need to be at the altar if you think like that. If you're too busy thinking, oh, that sermon is for someone else, you need to be at the altar. Because that's stronghold. That's bondage. You need to be set free in your mind. And that, like, I want to encourage you. Let that Jacob journey, let that journey of wrestling with God, if at any point in this sermon the Holy Spirit inspired or illuminated an area of stronghold, an area of potential trauma in your life, in your mind, in your heart if the holy spirit at any point in today's service illuminated that i want you to begin that pattern of wrestling with god that season of wrestling with god tonight right here at these altars i see that hand back there amen thank you jesus amen i want you to begin that pattern here at these altars tonight let's stand amen to our feet the altars are open you come and speak to god friends amen